was going to go to Santiago, Chile for, uh, the, for this massive, you know, participation in climate change conference, as well as, you know, a lot of social movements that's happening in Chile. But uh, because of the popular resistance on the ground, because people were, were fighting for justice on the ground, the government wasn't sure, didn't feel comfortable moving ahead with the United Nations conference. And so they backed out and moved it to Spain. So that's why we have two different delegations in two different places for kind of a common goal and a common purpose. So I am here just to help facilitate the conversation, just to moderate here, but you're not here to hear listen to me. You're here to listen to these amazing panelists that we have here today. And so I wanna kind of introduce our folks who are joining us in two different places in the world and it's different time zones. So it's kind of crazy. And this is something really ambitious for us to do. And uh, so we'll get right into it. Um, I'm gonna introduce each of the speakers, kind of read a little bit who they are, and then we'll just kind of listen to what folks have to say. So um, come in, I'll introduce the folks in Madrid right now. So wave your hands, I don't know if folks can see it. Um, Naisha Mallet is an 18 year old artist in climate justice, yeah, youth leader. Naisha was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and grew up in, in a Caribbean household. Her mother was born on the island of Grenada, so she understands the massive effects that climate change has on Caribbean co uh, countries of color like Puerto Rico and Grenada, who contribute the least to climate change, but experience the brunt of the crisis. Um, Naisha has joined Uprose. Uprose is a, an amazing climate justice organization based in New York City and um, is a tremendous member of the It Takes Roots Alliance. And so we're really happy to have Naisha here. Next to Naisha is Ariel Durange. She's the mother of two and a proud uh, Dene woman and is a member, member of the Athabascan Chippewan First Nation Treaty 8, Northern Alberta. And uh, Ariel is currently the executive director and co-founder of Indigenous Climate Action, ICA. Um, ICA is Canada's premier Indigenous-led climate justice organization, and um, she has a long bio. I'm not going to read it all, but she is freaking amazing, and she has done. Uh, she has a, a, a lengthy list of attributes and accolades that um, in in the fight for Mother Earth. So I'm really happy to have Ariel here on this call. Um, coming for, to us from Santiago, Chile. If you can wave, folks in in down in Chile can wave. Um, Christian Rodriguez is, new, is from New York, New Jersey, native born, raised in the ironbound section of New York, New Jersey, which is mostly a dis disadvantaged black, brown, and immigrant neighborhood that's surrounded by heavy polluting industries where factories operate right next to homes. Um, as a community organizer, they advocate for the right to breathe clean air, have access to clean water, healthy food, as well as advocating to stop racism and sexism. They are a youth mentor and youth organizer who currently works with youth from the neighborhood through bicycle repairs, ride outs, and community advocacy events. So thank you for having being on this call. And our last uh, panelist I want to introduce is Mafalda Galdemez Castro. Apologies for any name mistakes here. Um, Mafalda is a teacher, poet, feminist activist, founder and associate of National Association of Rural and Indigenous Women founder of Women Global March Chile, member of the organization of Cumbre de los Pueblos, and has published three poetry books. So Mafalda, thank you for being with us uh, today. Um, so I did that introductions, but I want to allow, allow some time for folks to speak uh, for themselves. And so I want to go down to our relatives in Chile here first. Um, and it's whoever wants to go first, kind of maybe just Say your name again and the organization that you're a part of, and um, tell us why. What are you participating? What's happening right now in Chile? Bueno, eh, esta presentación precisamente porque estamos reunidas acá en la cumbre de los pueblos y la cumbre de los pueblos se comenzó a organizar hace muchos meses en Chile. Bueno, ¿por qué estamos acá? Estamos en la Cumbre de los Pueblos, que es un proceso que comenzó en Chile hace muchos meses atrás y pensando en que íbamos a hacer la contracumbre de la COP25 que se realizaba en diciembre 
desde las instituciones públicas y los gobiernos. So why are we here? We are here because uh, we started organizing Cumbre de los Pueblos, which was an organization, um, a summit established uh, at the same time that COP25 was taking place. And y eh, que debido a todo el movimiento social que se está produciendo y la articulación de la que llamamos nosotros la revolución social en nuestro país, el gobierno, como decías anteriormente, decidió abandonar la COP25 y por eso precisamente se fue a España. Well, because of all of these social movements um, and the social revolution that uh, Chile is, uh, that's happening in Chile right now, the government decided to take a step back and not have, not having the COP25 uh, here. Ha sido un proceso intenso para nosotros los movimientos sociales porque eh, teníamos programado muchas actividades para eh, recibir a las delegaciones internacionales que venían a presentar sus propuestas a esta contracumbre y teníamos también delegaciones nacionales que iban a convivir y participar con las delegaciones internacionales con los diferentes temas que tienen que ver con la crisis climática y con la emergencia que estamos viviendo que, y que vive este planeta. So it's been a very intense couple of months. We were prepared to receive many delegations, international delegations that were supposed to uh, be related also with our national delegations here. And that didn't happen. And so it's been very interesting for all of us to be part of us, be a part of this, and also to talk about all of these uh, climate injustices that are taking place. Entonces ha sido todo un desafío continuar con nuestra cumbre de los pueblos y seguir avanzando en formar eh, los seminarios, los foros, los conversatorios, los diálogos que se están produciendo en este espacio que es la Universidad de Santiago de Chile. Acá, desde un comienzo, contamos con el apoyo de esta universidad que es pública, donde precisamente estudió Víctor Jara y que es una universidad emblemática para nuestro país, por lo que eh, era muy importante contar con ese apoyo. Y lo tenemos, porque acá estamos haciendo esta conferencia en la USAGE. It was a challenge to try to actually do this Cumbre de los Pueblos, this summit here. Because of this, we prepared so many uh, lectures and talks and discussions. Um, and we are still trying, well, trying to do all of this. Uh, but it's been hard and what was easier for us was to have the support of the university of this summit which is university of santiago chile which was actually the university that victor jara went and studied here uh, and, it was, and it's a very important university for chile so it's great to continue to have their support y es muy importante que nosotras hubiésemos seguido realizando nuestra cumbre porque el problema de la crisis climática no se termina porque se haya cambiado la sede. Y creemos que el problema está tan vigente en cualquier país del continente y eh, ese problema lo tenemos que enfrentar nosotros y nosotras desde los territorios desde nuestras comunidades, desde donde se está viviendo mayormente la crisis climática y que la tenemos en profundidad en Chile por muchos aspectos que seguramente lo podemos ir hablando más adelante. It was important for us to continue to do this Cumbre de los Pueblos because the problem, uh, and since it, it's now in Madrid, it, it's, the problems are still here. It, the problem of climate Uh, change is happening all over the world. And so that's why it's important, important for us to continue to do efforts to fight climate change from all of our territories. Chile tiene una crisis eh, social, una crisis política, una crisis económica y cultural. Estamos en una crisis profunda 
y este gobierno se niega a entender que esa crisis profunda la tenemos que enfrentar los pueblos de manera horizontal con nuestras propuestas que vienen desde las bases que está viviendo la problemática de vivir a raíz de este sistema neoliberal en una fase extractivista cruel e inhumana. Está enriqueciéndose mucha gente en Chile, pero esa gente se lleva los capitales hacia afuera y hay una tremenda inequidad en términos de eh, derechos laborales y en términos de justicia social y ambiental. Por lo tanto, esa inequidad la viven los pueblos desde los territorios por la falta y escasez de agua, por un extractivismo exacerbado de los recursos naturales en la minería y en, y en los mares, y porque eh, se, unas cuantas familias se están apropiando de todas nuestras riquezas en desmedro de millones de chilenos que viven con unos salarios indignos que no les permiten vivir dignamente. We are going through several crises here in Chile. One social, political, economical, and cultural um, crisis that's very deep, and our government denies the fact that this is taking place here. Uh, that is why it's important for us to work in as a community and to solve all of these problems from the base. Um, we have a, a neoliberal system here in Chile who's taking advantage of extra activism. And you can see that in several ways. We have several uh, families, very rich families, that are taking everything away from us and they are keeping all of the money and they are not investing. That is why we can see inequity in rights, in our rights, in our work, also injustices like social injustices, climate injustices. There are resources such as water and mining in the mining industry, the seas, that they are taking advantage of all of that, all of these rich people. And it's just a few of them that are taking everything. Y eh, ahora voy a hablar un poco sobre las mujeres. Eh, Quienes sufren el mayor impacto eh, de la pobreza y de la vulneración de derechos en estos momentos en el país, precisamente son las mujeres. Porque las mujeres son las que estamos afrontando desde hace muchos años eh, el activismo social. En este país masivamente las mujeres pasaron a la punta. Eh, no eran nuestros compañeros los dirigentes hombres. Eran las mujeres las que estábamos llevando la lucha en Chile. Éramos las mujeres las que habíamos salido a la calle masivamente y millones fuimos las que salimos este 8 de marzo y que en una eh, marcha histórica que no se había realizado, pero en mucho tiempo en nuestro país. Así que eh, eran ellas las que estaban sintiendo el mayor impacto económico en sus hogares por esta eh, ineficacia en tratar de ordenar el sistema eh, para hacerlo más igualitario. Tenemos un desfase en el tema de la salud enorme, tenemos una privatización de la educación que afecta por supuesto a todos los hogares de los sectores más vulnerados de nuestra sociedad. Tenemos el tema de la vivienda, en que las viviendas son eh, inhóspitas y van provocando mucha promiscuidad en los hogares, que significa que en un espacio reducido tiene que vivir una familia con hijos, tiene que compartir eh, eh, un dormitorio, los padres, los niños, las niñas, no hay diversiones, plazas de juego, son villas de miseria. Y esas millas de miseria van provocando entonces todo un ambiente eh, que es un círculo que provoca delincuencia, drogadicción, alcoholismo. Y las mujeres sentimos eso en el día a día. Por eso estamos acá. Y por eso nos impacta fuertemente esta situación en Chile, principalmente a las mujeres. And now I will speak a little bit about women who are the population that's receiving the biggest 
out of the, all of these social conflicts that we're seeing here in Chile. Women are the ones who suffer poverty the most. Also, their rights are vulnerated. And they are the ones that have been working and for a very long time in social activism. The men who were the leaders weren't helping us and they weren't alongside with us. It was us as women who were fighting uh, for rights. And we were able to see that and see how many women were part of it on March 8th, where we had a, uh, well, a, a huge march that day for women. It was a milestone in our history. And well, women are the ones that are impacted the most in terms of uh, the economy. And we want to change the system. We want to change everything that has been happening here and to make it more equal for all, for all of us. There are several things that are affected by what uh, that we can see that are affected and, and affect us, <clears throat> which is a health system. Also, the privatization of education, education here. That's something every home, you can see in every home, it's very vulnerable. Also, the homes, the houses are very small. There is promiscuity. Um, you, it, people live in very small, reduced spaces where there, there is no fun, there is misery, a lot of alcohol, delinquency, and drugs, and it is a circle that they cannot live. I want to take a, a moment here, just a moment here. Uh, again, for folks that might have just joining, you're watching a live stream webinar. Um, my name is Dallas Goldtooth with the, the Indigenous Environmental Network, a part of the It Takes Roots Alliance, and we have two groups of folks here, one in, based in Madrid, uh, Spain, and the other one that's currently in Santiago, Chile, and we're getting a live rep a report back. Um, if it's okay, can we, I wanna transition over to uh, Christian, if you could, I wanna ask you a, a, a question. Um, if that's okay, Mafalda, is that all right? Um, Christian, I, I guess the question is, is that we, you traveled a long way, you know, you're coming all the way from the East Coast of the so-called United States of America. You're there on the ground. I want to know, there's two questions is why, why are we, why did we send folks there? Why are you there? You know, not in a personal sense, but also like, why are we sending folks there? Why is it important? And what have you been seeing so far? What have you been learning? Hey, everybody. So yeah, I did come a long way from, uh, Newark, New Jersey, that long flight was not uh, fun at all. It's tiring, so. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're essentially here, you know, for solidarity. It's, you know, the things that are going on here in Chile, um, it, it, it's happening in our own neighborhoods. It's happening, you know, in the so-called United States. Um, you know, we have uh, privatization of, you know, water, you know, um, you know, trash and everything, you know, things that are, are, are free to us, you know, they're, it's, things that we're seeing here in Chile, it's happening in the United States as well. So, um, you know, Chile is like the, the, the way the people are just mobilizing and, and just are, they're very inspirational here. They're out here just, you know, um, you know, the artwork in the street is amazing. They're, they have like all the messages, um, you know, on the wall, just depicting like essentially what the community is, is asking for. And so, um, you know, seeing that, seeing, seeing the way that Chile has um, has organized themselves and able to, to mobilize themselves is, is somewhat, you know, it, it is an inspiration to us because um, the things, like I said, that are happening here are happening in the States. And, and um, we definitely need, like, looking at Chile is actually, you know, it's actually helping us um, being able to, to hone in on, on what's happening in, in our neighborhoods and able to um, essentially like have that motivation to be able to move forward and do the same thing that Chile is doing here to do that there. Um, the community that I come from, it's majority black, brown, and you know, um, majority of the, the community members are from Latin America, right? So, um, oh, you're fresh. And, and we're, in, we're in environments or communities where there's several environmental, you know, issues. Um, we have like garbage incinerators in our backyards. We have uh, pollution. We have contamination. We have so much that's going on uh, out there. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's because of our capitalist mind frame that, you know, we have to make money off of everything. And 
the ones who are often uh, affected by it are people like us, you know, people like me, um, people like my community, people like, you know, Mafalda's community. So um, we're here in solidarity with them to essentially learn from them, learn, you know, learn about their work, learn um, how they're able to come together and, and, and you know, stand up for, for, for their rights, for, for what they need in their community um, so that um, yeah, so yeah, I'm sorry. I, and um, um, you're good. You're good. good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, we got more chance. We can come back and I want to okay. ask both more questions. Um, but I want to take a moment to, to transition to our relatives across the big waters over in Madrid, Spain, um, who are who are have been there for a couple of days. I think I, I think Ariel, you've been there for a while. But um, yeah, well, so let's just go over to, to our folks who are in Madrid, Spain at the COP25, the United Nations Climate Talks, um, they're the climate change conference that is that was originally supposed to be in Santiago, is now in Madrid. And maybe I'll pass over to Ariel just to kind of give us a context, if you could, of what is happening or, you know, what is the COP and kind of just get lay, lay the ground, the foundation of what's going on. And we can go over to Naisha a little bit. Thanks everyone. So Eklanete, Dene Sotaneta, Ariel Tsa Ekwe Hushe, Duranje Betsy and Ihesli. Uh so when that was just me saying hello in my language, uh Dene Sotane. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm really excited to be on this webinar with our sisters down in uh, Chile, Santiago. Um, and just really excited that this is an opportunity to just sort of talk about the fact that these meetings, these conference of the parties, COPs meetings are spaces where a lot of state leaders are coming together to negotiate and discuss technical advice at this particular COP on what is called the rule book for the Paris Agreement. And the challenge is, is that a lot of the negotiations that have happened at previous COPs have been sort of setting the standards of what we're going to, to do to try and address this climate crisis, but from the very perspectives of the colonial and state governments that are responsible for the repression and oppression of our people, that are responsible for, for the austerity measures that we're seeing in Chile, for the theft of indigenous lands and territories from my own homelands in, in North America, in so-called Canada. And so as an indigenous person, I have participated in COPs for the last 10 years because it's important that we not only show up to have a voice within these spaces to assert our nationhood, our sovereignty and self-determination, but to ensure that these state leaders don't continue on the path of destruction that they have done for the last 500 years plus. You know, uh, I think one of the most prominent things that's recently come for me, come to me was I was on a panel just a week before coming to the COP and, and uh, uh, a man asked me, do indigenous peoples in Canada experience or talk about climate change? And I, I said to him, well, we definitely experience climate change. And I gave him a bunch of examples, you know, flooding, forest fires, drought, the standard that's happening everywhere. And I said, you know, we don't always talk and use the words climate change. And when you start talking to our communities about climate change, they actually start talking about colonization. They talk about extractivism. They talk about the oppression of our people. And colonization was the beginning of climate change for our people. And so it's important that we come to these spaces and these meetings to intervene and intercept with these state leaders that are responsible for so much of the disparities that our communities have experienced for, for, for centuries. So at this particular COP, they're talking about the rule book for the Paris Accord. And, you know, it, it's important to, again, to interject, but it's also important to uplift the fact that this COP got moved to Spain, the colonial heartland of country of, of the, the country of Chile. And you look at the, the optics of that and you realize that it was literally ripped out from under this country that for the first time or in a long time that they were we were going to have a COP in the global south where so much of uh, a climate change, the extractivism and the oppression of indigenous peoples has happened. And they've had very little voice in these, these 
these uh, spaces because of because of the borders that have been imposed, because of visa restrictions and our inabilities to to travel freely as individuals, and that was ripped away by the same colonial governments that imposed those things to to not allow them to travel to other cops in the past. And so here we are again, <laughs> and it's so important to raise the voices of those that are so marginalized from these conversations. So. For myself, um, I've been a part of the Indigenous Peoples Caucus and working groups within the caucus or within the, the COP. But in addition to that, I've also participated in the outside strategies because we can't just be uplifting those colonial systems. We also have to publicly call them out in the streets and to the public because that's what matters. We're not gonna make the change from inside if that's all we do. We also have to raise like noise and in, in, in the streets and with the people so that everyone knows just how broken the structures are inside those spaces. And so I feel like we have to employ these inside and outside tactics and strategies, to sort of put a cog in the machine from the inside, but also to raise and build our people from the outside so that we can rise up for the real systems change that we need. Thank you so much for that, the, the groundwork. And I think you, and you hit it right on the nail there, Ariel, about like the bigger picture is our folks, people use, a lot of people use the word climate change, but really when it comes down to it, a lot of our communities, black, brown, indigenous across the globe are dealing with colonization, an ongoing process that has never ended for a lot of our communities and for our homelands. And so thank you for giving that great, that the bigger context that oftentimes the organizations that we work with, the climate justice organizations, the EJ organizations, our environmental justice organizations often have that same approach that it's a systems, that we're, we're dealing with the system here and we're only responding to the symptoms of that symptoms of that system. Um, so we have to take a big picture approach to, to creating the change that we want to see. Um, I want to pass over to Naisha. Thank you for, for being uh, joining us here. Uh, Naisha is an amazing, powerful voice, uh, an organizer, and is uh, representing UPROSE as well as uh, other affiliations there in, in Chile. And uh, Naisha, you organized a youth summit back in your home community not too long ago. Um, it was a climate justice youth summit. And now you're there at the United Nations Climate Talk. So tell us a little bit about why is it what, that experience of being there, what you're learning, and why is it important for us to center in, uh, youth in the conversation on climate justice? Hi, um, yeah, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here and, and talk in this webinar. Um, I think it's important that young people like myself are here because it's important for us to understand and visualize what these spaces look like and to also be a part of in these spaces. Um, I know that I didn't really understand what a cop is and I'm, I'm actually really understanding and I'm learning right now. And that's, I think that's the main goal of um, young people being here is again, to understand how these um, world leaders are using their voices um, and how, um, how they should be sticking up for their people and making sure that they're doing what they have to do, not only for um, the general of, uh, of who they're speaking for, but the youth, because um, it is our future. And um, we should have our eyes on them because um, we have to witness what's going on. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's important for, for me to be here and to learn and to understand um, how things like this take place. What's uh, as a follow up question, what's it been like? What's what is it actually like at the COP again? What is it, what's the vibe right now? Yeah, so um, we've been taking um, I've been sitting on a lot of side events that are talking about different um, topics on like um, just transition, geoengineering, why um, carbon markets and carbon offsets are wrong and how they are false solutions. And that I for what I'm understanding is that we're spending a lot of time speaking on Article six, which is not something that is fixable. It's something that in my opinion should be <laughs> not here. And we should be focusing on real solutions that people of color and indigenous people have. Like we have the answers. We're telling you what we want and what we need to do and nobody's listening. So that's why we have to come here and let them know we have the solutions and you need to listen. So um, we did a, a action today um, a theater action, which was really cool. 
um, we had um, a lot of our people from the delegation speak on panels, and they were very powerful and strong. Um, so I, I really appreciate just sitting in those spaces and learning um, from the people around me because there's so much knowledge around me. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying just gaining information and taking it back with me so that I know how to approach situations that's going on in New York and in Brooklyn that's happening all over the world because we're all um, in solidarity and we're all dealing with the same things. Thank you for the for the response there. I'm gonna have a question for Ariel and then we're gonna go back down to Santiago because I have a question for Mafalda um, after this. But Ariel, I, I know that, you know, a lot of right now the messaging for folks that don't know, um, there's a couple of different places where you wanna, if you wanna follow along what's happening at the COP25 in Madrid, you can uh, check out It Takes Roots on Facebook and, and uh, Instagram. You can follow Indigenous Rising or Indigenous Environmental Network on both Facebook and Instagram. And you can also find, uh, follow Indigenous Climate Action, which is uh, Ariel Durange's organization, who is also you know, posting amazing videos and content online. But Ariel, um, there's a lot of conversation on Article 6. And, and, mm -hmm. and folks that are watching, we all know the United Nations process, it's all jargon. It's like, it's dominant. That's, part, that's how colonization works, is they force us to use their language and their words. And it's really hard for us to translate that for our own people, even for ourselves. So Ariel, in a kind of, I guess, succinct way, what is the main issue on the table right now? I know you brought it up about this, the, the rule book, but what is Article 6 and what is the danger in that? So people at home who are following along can really kind of start to uh, understand that. And then after that, we're going to go back down to Santiago to have, do a follow-up question down there. I like how you want me to succinctly tell you what an article of a UN convention is, but I will try my best. So Article 6 is one of the articles of the Paris Agreement that talks about the voluntary actions that states can do to reduce their emissions. Um, and the issue, the current issue with Article 6 at this given moment is that it's almost wholly uh, based on this idea of market-based mechanisms. But in the original version of Article 6, it was supposed to be market and non-market solutions to reducing emissions. But there is a huge emphasis on only looking at carbon markets as the way that countries are going to be able to reduce their emissions through international carbon market mechanisms, which is the scariest thing that we could be talking about. Because this means that we would be allowing countries to trade offsets, conservation offsets, biological diversity offsets, and carbon sink offsets. And what's scary is if you look at the statistics, 80% of the world's biodiversity and some of the richest carbon sinks on the planet exist within Indigenous territories. And so that means that Indigenous territories, which are already threatened by colonial uh, structures and systems and forms of extractivism, are going to be further uh, threatened through a carbon offset trading mechanism. And so we have to absolutely be pushing um, for non-market solutions. And someone asked me, well, what's a non-market solution? Indigenous communities and people of color have been living in, an, in direct relationship and harmony with our natural environments for millennia. And this we've done and we've created these massive biodiverse rich regions that have helped to maintain climate stabilization up into this point. And guess what? We've done it with non-market based solutions for millennia. And we still continue to do it to this day. We don't need to be paid to protect our lands and territories. What needs to happen is we need to get ourselves right. We need to right our relationships with each other and with the world and the planet. Because what has happened is we have become so disconnected from where we come from, that we are a part of this living ecosystem. And non-market solutions are based on the values of land-based and indigenous communities that have those connections that are non-market based, that directly relate the values of who we are in our communities and the wealth and the prosperity and the health of our communities is directly related to intact ecosystems. And so article six, needs to drop carbon market mechanisms and it needs to ensure and uphold and respect human rights and the rights of indigenous communities. Otherwise, it's just another mechanism for corporations and governments to continue systems of colonization and appropriation of lands and territories. 
I, I want to ask you, uh, Ariel, what is like a, a real life example for you? You're based in so-called Canada. You, you've been, the Dene territory is in, in Northern Alberta. You are, come from a community um, that has been dealing with one of the largest carbon bombs on the planet, the tar sands development area. Um, what does this mean in like the simple terms? What does it mean for uh, an example, I guess, of how this would work or what, what the government of Canada might be trying to do uh, at this time? And yeah. so, yeah. So right now, uh, a really great example is that in the face of this climate crisis, uh, there's still a, an expansion of oil and gas. In fact, a report just dropped today by like a bunch of you know, environmental organizations that did some statistic studies and data. And we are actually like increasing our production of, of oil and gas on the planet. Uh, and we're doing it largely in the face that we're going to have these carbon market systems in the future so we'll just offset these projects. Um, and Canada and the United States, just for, for Americans out there listening, is Canada and the United States account for 85% of the increase in oil production that we'll be seeing over the next uh, five years. And that's the Permian uh, Basin, but it's also things like the Alberta tar sands. So in my territory right now, the largest ever proposed tar sands mine is currently on the book by a company called Tech and the mine is called the Frontier Mine. It's called the Frontier Mine because it's so far north and in indigenous territories that they've called it, like it's the new frontier of oil sands and tar sands development. And it's going to be bigger than the city of Vancouver. It's going to uh, withdraw massive amounts of water, use a massive amount of energy, destroy critical habitat for species and disrupt, further disrupt the lives of my own community and many of the other indigenous peoples in the region through um, the contamination of our water systems and our animals and food sources, as well as the air quality in the region. And these projects, will have the ability to be justified through an international uh, trade carbon trading mechanism if articles like Article 6 are successful in moving forward wholly on carbon market systems. We cannot afford to put forward false solutions that allow corporations and governments to create sacrifice zones like my own territory in Treaty 8 or other communities like the Sariaku and the Sapra or the people in, uh, in, in North Dakota that are dealing with the Bakken oil fields or the Permian Basin. These places will be able to have the san sanction to just buy themselves out of uh, this, these, through these carbon offset systems and allow them to continue to do this. And we can't afford this, not from a human rights perspective and not from an indigenous perspective. Thank you. Uh, Mafalda, I want to go back to you here and, you know, um, to tell us a little bit what there's some, a significant date, something actually happened, just a number of things have been happening in Chile that are very significant, not only for people that live in Chile, but, you know, has had an effect in the global south. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about October 18th and kind of what happened on October 18th and what is happening now uh, in, in the context of that? El 18 de octubre comenzó con una actividad que hicieron los estudiantes. Eh, ellos son de la enseñanza media. Okay, so on October um, 18th, everything started with a movement, a mobilization from the students, high school students. Y fue una respuesta a un alza de pasaje de Eh, la movilización subterránea que es el metro de Santiago pero esta respuesta tenía que ver con muchas rebeldías acumuladas desde hace muchos años desde el estudiantado ok, and this was because there was an increase on the subway fare and because of that and the students were upset about that and also because they had been mobilized for several years already. So they were aware of what was going on in the country. El estudiantado se encuentra desde hace unas tres generaciones absolutamente endeudado por la privatización de la educación. Y el pasaje fue una gota que rebalsó el vaso simplemente para ello. So students of about three generations already have massive debts because our education is privatized. 
and the increase in the fare of the, met of the metro of the subway was just the last thing that happened that caused all of these problems, all of this uh, anger. Y eh, el gobierno seguramente pensaba que el estudiantado iba a con, eh, contar con la desaprobación de las familias y de la gente adulta de lo que ellos hicieron en el metro al romper los torniquetes. And the government thought that the families and the adults wouldn't have been um, supporting them because they were destroying parts of the metro and the entrances. Pero no sucedió así. Y fue todo al revés y el pueblo entonces comenzó a manifestarse en apoyo de los estudiantes y comenzó a salir a las calles a manifestarse públicamente en contra de todas las medidas represivas que podía aplicarse a estas movilizaciones y respondimos de una manera entonces multitudinaria en una gran marcha que reunió más de un millón de personas en la ciudad de Santiago. And so that didn't happen, and the students received the support of everyone in Chile. And we were able to see that on a march that took place on, on a Friday, and it had one million people in the streets supporting the students. It was massive. Y la multitudinaria marcha arrojaba montones de eh, consignas, afiches, lienzos, con muchas demandas que fueron las demandas sentidas de todo el pueblo que hasta ahora está siendo entonces reprimido por ejercer sus legítimos derechos de protesta nacional. And so at this march we were able to see many slogans, many demands of the people and everyone is putting out their, uh, their, their, their own fight. Las protestas nacionales van encausadas a un objetivo principal y es asamblea constituyente para una nueva constitución. La constitución de Chile en estos momentos es la misma que elaboró la dictadura militar y que dejó amarradas leyes fundamentales para el enriquecimiento de unos pocos y el endeudamiento de muchos millones de personas. And so the national protest have, it has just one uh, particular goal, which is changing our constitution into a constituent assembly. Uh, the constitution that we have today is the same constitution that was established during the dictatorship, the military dictatorship, dictatorship that we had that um, has the, the same legislations that it used to have before, which forces us and, and helps all of the ones that are in authority in the end. Esta nueva constitución requiere cambios fundamentales para el país, que son devolver eh, el, el derecho humano, por ejemplo, del agua, porque ahora el agua en Chile está privatizada y es un lucro se comercia con el agua y eh, entonces esa es una de las principales demandas que requiere una nueva constitución. Esa nueva constitución también requiere un cambio fundamental en el sistema de la educación, una educación pública de calidad, no una educación privada que depende de cuánto pagas para cuánto eh, exiges para ese sistema de educación. Una, una salud pública, la gente hoy se muere en los hospitales esperando una hora para un examen o para una atención eh, hospitalaria y puede pasar un año sin que se le otorgue esa atención, puede morirse en el intento de esperar un cupo en una cama de hospital y también necesitamos entonces reformas laborales que vayan en beneficio de la gran cantidad de trabajadores y trabajadoras para salarios dignos. Necesitamos que se rebajen sustancialmente los sueldos de los diputados y senadores, que son vergonzantemente más del 40% de lo que es un salario digno y de lo que actualmente no están haciendo mucho 
al cambiar las leyes. So we need a, a fundamental change that when one of our main problems is that water is, in, is private here. So they profit from water. And that's the number one demand that we have. The second one is to your internet is going out there, just a heads up. Uh, public education system. I, we're going to, I'll go jump over to uh, our folks in Madrid to uh, tell they can get the, their sound going here. Can you all still hear me? I've just tried to mute it, but I don't know. I think it's still going through. <laughs> um, Ariel, Naisha, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. If it's okay, um, Naisha, maybe you, you can access just... Oh, there we go. Access that, uh, in this thing for an exam, you can... Whoa, that was like... We'll just take a pause there and let the, the internet catch up. Um, Naisha, if we can jump over. Um, you know, I, I guess it can be confusing for folks. I think I can see from perspective that we're talking about carbon markets and climate change, and we're, in, we're talking about social mobile movements happening in Chile. Um, and then we have folks who are doing youth organizing in, in the United States and they're there. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on. So why, you know, what's going on here? What's your perspective of this? What, what is the, what, what's connecting us in this struggle? You know what I mean? And I wanna hear from you is like, you know, I'm sure you get it. I get it at times. People say, what do you do? And you know, oh, you're an organizer of climate justice. Like, what is that? And what we try to explain is it's a lot of different things, but how do you explain the, all these threads that are happening we're discussing here? Yeah, um, every, I, my understanding is that everything we do, we do is interconnected. Everything that we're fighting for is interconnected and it falls under the theme of climate justice, right? We're fighting for climate justice and what that looks like in communities of color and in indigenous communities. And it's similar, is similar. Um, we're fighting for water rights. We're fighting for rights to air that we breathe. Why do we have to fight for that? I don't understand. Um, it's something that is natural and is here given on earth. But I think that we live, we live in a world that um, doesn't understand and doesn't respect the earth we live on. Um, <clears throat> and that's why we, we have to um, have this fight. But from New York, to Canada, to Chile, we're fighting for the same things. And it's important that we can see, we see that um, the fights are interconnected and that young people are rising up and taking their stance to this fight. And um, yeah, so we're fighting for our land, we're fighting for our rights. Um, we're fighting to be people on this earth and to live on this earth that we deserve to live on and we deserve to breathe on, we deserve clean water, we deserve everything and we're fighting for it and we shouldn't be, but we're, we are. Thank you. Uh, Mafalda, I know that you got cut off there. So if you have a chance, we can uh, see if your internet's a little bit better, you, all, you can finish up your, your thoughts. Mira, eh, ¿cuál es el Mira, eh, yo eh, antes de, de, del <ríe> intervalo iba a hablar del tema de la migración, que es un tema que nos, que nos une en, este, en el continente y en el mundo entero. La migración siempre es por factores de pobreza, por factores de buscar nuevas condiciones de vida que sean más dignas y más humanitarias para la familia. Y en Chile está muy ligado a que este gobierno eh, hacia afuera siempre entregaba un mensaje de que este es un país que estaba en la cúspide del exitismo ¿no? de, de este modelo neoliberal. Uh, 
Um, so before we had a bad signal here, I wanted to mention something about migration, which is a topic that unites us all. Migration, it's usually done by people who are suffering poverty and that want new conditions. They want to have better lives and a better life for their families. And our government today uh, continues and used to talk about how successful we were in Latin America in their system that they have. Y entonces con ese mensaje citista vendió hacia el mundo la, la farsa, la farsa decimos nosotros porque vendió la farsa de que este era un modelo que tenía todo el país contento. Y entonces empezó a abrir su fronteras para que empezaran a llegar migrantes de todos los países nuestros eh, vecinos a encontrar aquí lo que no tenían en su territorio y les ofreció entonces la famosa eh, búsqueda del oro perdido, cosa que no existía. And so our government with this fake speech that we had achieved uh, the best model of capitalism Um, he kind of sold that, that, that speech and made us look that, that we were like a, a country that was happy and that could receive everyone and that they could find gold here. And that wasn't like that. Y no había una política migratoria. El gobierno nunca había realizado una política migratoria para recibir a migrantes masivamente, para darles un, un buen eh, sistema económico y para otorgarles los mínimos beneficios que tenía que otorgarles por, por derecho propio a cada humano que llega al país a buscar, en búsqueda de, de trabajo y de mejores expectativas de vida. And so our country didn't have migration policies. Uh, the government never prepared to receive all of the migrants that arrived and they were never given all of the benefits that every human should receive. Así que hubo un momento en que esa explosión migratoria se tuvo que parar y tuvieron que actuar con medidas emergentes, pero ya la migración estaba en Chile, ya el pueblo ya había entendido que había que solidarizar con la gente migrante, no había que aplicar eh, políticas discriminatorias y había que tener un sentido de humanidad para recibirlos y atenderlos como correspondía. Por lo tanto, eso ah, también a todos los sectores más vulnerables de nuestro país les afectó porque llegaron a ocupar los mismos cordones de pobreza que ya tenían miles de chilenos en nuestro país. And so migration uh, arrived here, many people came and the government decided that that had to be stopped. But there were people here already, already and we all as Chileans decided to receive them with solidarity and humanity. Um, but these people who came started occupying uh, the same places of those who were poor here already. And so they are in the same line of poverty, nothing changed for them. Lo que pasa actualmente es que tenemos una crisis laboral tremenda porque los salarios bajaron hubo una caída de salario, hay mucha cesantía, hay mucho trabajador migrante o, o nacional que está viviendo con, por el día, vendiendo cosas pero ínfimas, lo que menos uno se espera, el mercado está lleno de baratijas y productos que no son productos necesarios porque el mercantilismo y, y el y la política de comprar, comprar, entonces está metida en el ADN de toda la gente y cree que comprando baratijas es feliz y esa entonces también tiene una crisis cultural en nuestro país. And today we have a, a working crisis. The salaries went down, unemployment went up. The people who don't have jobs, have to sell things like very cheap products that no one really needs, but that continues to uh, feed on this uh, consumers, uh, consumism. And so everyone needs to buy just to buy and in that way they think they're happy. 
No sé, creo que la situación está... Voy a terminar, voy a, a redondear ya la, la, la entrevista. Creo que la situación es súper problemática. Nosotros sentimos que esto es para largo, no tiene solución fácil, porque eh, como todos sabemos, como todas las personas entendemos, es muy difícil abandonar los privilegios cuando se tienen de tal manera. Por lo tanto, esta crisis va para largo, pero lo que nos tiene esperanzados es que los movimientos organizados están eh, decididos a continuar unidos avanzando en una lucha común, que es conseguir una nueva asamblea constituyente para una nueva constitución. And so to wrap it up, we have a lot of problems and these problems are in the long term. They will not be solved easily and they do not have an easy solution. It is hard for those who have privilege to let go and that's why it's so hard uh, for this movement. But as the organizations are, are moving and they are so determined on this fight, I think we'll be, we have hope. Thank you. I'll go over to, to Christian. Uh, for folks who are still following along, um, people are watching not only in the Zoom app, but they're also watching on Facebook Live. Uh, so okay. folks that are watching, uh, hello, thank you for joining. This is a webinar live report back. Uh, while our, we have two delegations, one in Santiago, Chile, and another group in uh, Madrid, Spain, for two different uh, gatherings, one for the UN Climate Change Conference in, in Spain, and the other one in Chile is for uh, a people's social movement uh, gathering that's happening down there. And so we are getting this live report back from folks who are actually there right now in the middle of it. Um, and we're hearing kind of what is going on, but also the reasons why they're there. And so I want to go over to Christian and, and maybe a, a question I have for you is, you had mentioned earlier, there's some things that folks can learn from this, like folks back home where you come from, um, up in the Northeast, you know, there's something, I guess the question is, is what, what could we, coming from the global North, in, in the belly of the beast, in the, in the belly of the, the, the so-called United States and so-called Canada, um, what can we learn from our relatives in the global south who have been doing uh, some amazing mass movements and some liberation movements uh, in the past, in for, for a while now? What, what, are we, what can we learn from that, those experiences, and what do we, what do we bring home to our peoples? Oh, we can learn from, um, from from the way they've, they've mobilized and gotten together. You have folks of all ages just coming together. We have women that are, are the women group are, are amazing. They're out here, they're stopping traffic to do flash mobs and like, um, just, you know, let people know, you know, what it is that they're, they're manning and requesting. So I think that this definitely that we can take back home is, you know, how, um, how they took art and how they, they, they transformed that art to actually send a message, you know, I'm, I'm walking around the streets and I'm seeing uh, messages, Les you know, lesbians without fear, like that really, you know, um, honed in on me, you know, I felt like that resonated with me. You Christian, have, can you, you know, hold the microphone a little bit closer so we can hear you? Art that says, you, you know, um, you know, be feminist or not. Um, it's so much, so much, so much good information and so much artwork, so much, so much uh, pictures, videos, um, the way these folks are mobilizing, it's, it's amazing. And I think this is what we can definitely take back. The inspiration, Mafalda has been so wonderful. Oh my God, these women are amazing. These people are amazing. I, I, I just feel like I'm at home. I feel like, um, you know, the work that they're doing is, is amazing. And, and, and I know this, this right here, this, mo this movement, this, it's right now, it, it's, it's in the front news, you know, it's, it's out there. We're trying to get it out there, right? And so I think other people, the other, uh, you know, the other, the global South and the rest of the Americas um, will look at this and, 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 and will actually like, you know, can actually say, you know, you know what? You know, we don't have to stand for this either. You know, just like Chileans, we can definitely stand up, you know, rise up, right? Um, shout out to, to um, um to the folks out there in Detroit, you know, you know, rise up, right? We got to rise up, say something, rise up. So, um, you know, this is what I think we can take, definitely take back. Um, you know, the, the good stuff that you guys are doing here. 
Appreciate that. I, I'll go over to the folks over in Spain. I, either one of you can answer it. It's kind of an, a follow-up to that is like, how do we globalize this fight? Because we're fighting a global system, right? This is really when, when we're talking about carbon markets, um, we're talking about capitalism. I mean, let's just put it out there. That's what we're dealing with is we have all this jargon and carbon mar markets and like, uh, I don't know, all these acronyms, but really we're talking about capitalism and how countries of the world are saying, oh yeah, we have a climate crisis. So let's use capitalism as a way to fix the problem and many of our folks on the ground and many of your groups and communities that you work with are saying capitalism is what's caused the problem so it can't fix itself um so this is a global fight this is a global struggle how can we globalize our resistance to it how do we push back and grow together and that so i'm it's a big question very broad but i'm asking for to either of our, our relatives over there right now in Madrid, uh, what are your thoughts on it? We have, you know, indigenous peoples, peasants, farmers, students, youth, uh, folks just in the trap, in the struggle, and, um, women who are leading this uh, all across the world. Um, how are we bringing that together? Are we doing it now? What is what's your guys' thoughts? Um, I think we're definitely doing it right now. Just being in spaces where we all can come together and sit down and strategize and, and talk about what's the problem and come up with solutions is is the best way to, to fight this fight. And we're doing it right now. Just being on this webinar, just being in Spain together is, is part of our fight. Um, so I think that's it's important and it adds to the reason why, why we're all here. Um, it adds to the reason why we're, most of you are in Chile because we have to, to split up. We have to go to the places um, where things are happening and um, we have to learn from each other and, and, and come back to our communities and implement those, implement those same solutions. Um, yeah. I, I think like on top of that, like there's, I was thinking about what Mafalda was saying around, um, you know, like the, the system is created so you become like dependent on it. Like you, mm -hmm. you, you get bought into this structure of like wanting to buy and consume and, you know, like live the American dream. And I think one of the most um, like radical acts against the state is to find ways to loosen its grip on your own life. And that's by building community. That's by building community that isn't reliant on those systems and the structures. And part of that is building this global community and like this webinar is part of that it's like coming across those barriers those borders those colonial structures it's letting go of these capitalist systems that have made us believe that we need to consume all of these things that we don't really need and so we have to start to break these mindsets and we also have to focus on not changing the minds of government officials but working with our own communities to break these internalized systems of oppression that we have adopted through this indoctrination into these colonial structures of extractivism, of capitalism, of hyper individuality. You know, our, 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 our systems and our way of being before the current structures of systemic white supremacy and colonization were collective rights. We worked as units that everyone had a place and a value everyone contributed to the for the entire community as a whole and there was no hyper individuality that currently exists now and i think like that is some of the most radical work we do is not getting so caught up in like what am i it's not what am i doing it's what are we doing when we can build those communities, we can start to rise up stronger and we will be bigger than those governments and those systems of capitalism, systems of white supremacy, systems of extractivism. We have to work together. And the best way to do that is break those clutches and build community in our own homes and then connect those communities with other communities that aren't connected to those big systems. So folks are watching right now on Zoom, you can ask a question. So if you, through the Zoom app, um, if you have any questions for the panelists, um, provide, type that in, and we'll, we're gonna be moderating that. If folks are watching on Facebook Live, we have people who are monitoring those chats as well. So if there's any questions there, feel free to ask them at this time, um, if you have any questions for the folks in this space right now. Um, I'm gonna go to both, uh, well, back, oh, back over to Madrid. Uh, what can people do at home? to support the work in, in 
that you're doing right now in Chile, right? What actions can folks take, even if it's simply like following certain places or certain streams? Like, what can people do? And then I'll, I'll and the same question goes for our folks down in in Chile. Um, you know, what what can folks at home do to support your struggle? So before go over to Madrid first here, um, Naisha or Ariel. Um, yeah, well, one, send the love, <laughs> send the love all across. Um, we definitely need love up over here. Um, but yeah, um, do your parts in, in sharing the message of social media has always been a, a huge um, platform um, for getting across messages. But um, think about how, again, we, we were talking about um, creating communities. Think about what is going on in your communities and what are the solutions to change that? Um, I think I want to go back to like he was talking about like how these systems are oppressing us. Um, African people of the global south have been oppressed by um, a lot of these these systems that are being set that are set in place. But we are also people who are resilient, and we have always been resilient, and we have the answers, and we need to keep pushing back. And we're doing that. So continue to do what we we're doing now and um, using your voice and, and having young people use their voice. Um, I think that is um, an important aspect. Yep, you want me to go? Uh, we'll go down, down to uh, folks down in Chile. Uh, how, how can folks, uh, just to repeat the question, what, if, what folks can do to help you in your struggle at this moment, at this moment? Desde Chile, sí. Eh, desde Chile, nosotras en, la, en estos momentos estamos agradeciendo la solidaridad internacional. Eso, eso es básico y es primordial. La solidaridad internacional reaccionó inmediatamente y en todas las embajadas del mundo hubo protesta y para nosotras y nosotros eso fue fundamental porque este gobierno cree que todo lo que nosotros hablamos y decimos dentro son mentiras pero cuando viene la protesta desde afuera es diferente. Así que, eh, primero, nuestro agradecimiento. So we, are very, we are thankful because of the international solidarity. We saw it right away. Everyone reacted once we started mobilizing, and we were able to see that in all of the embassies. Everyone was demonstrating outside embassies and that's the way we saw the solidarity from international communities. The government in Chile thinks that we, all we do is say lies. And when we are taking the, that message across and so that people are doing it in other embassies, they, they know that this is not a lie. It's something that everyone thinks all over the world. En segundo lugar, tenemos que seguir hablando y denunciando los, el tema de los derechos humanos. La represión y la militarización ha sido horrible. Hay miles de personas heridas, 270 personas perdieron su vista porque fue un ataque directo a marcar a las personas para toda la vida. Y eso tiene que ser una denuncia permanente hasta lograr una reparación para esas personas. Necesitamos la reparación de el daño moral, físico y económico que se les ha causado y que se les causará para toda la vida. The other aspect in which we need help is in terms of human rights. We have received repression from our government. Uh, we were militarized as well for a few days. 270 people lost their sight. And this was an attack that was uh, on purpose. They wanted to mark people. And this is what we need uh, right now. We need that permanent reparation in terms of social justice, inequalities, and everything that comes along. Y en tercer lugar, el tema de la solidaridad internacional frente al tema cambio climático y, en, y de la crisis. ¿Cómo enfrentamos la crisis? Eh, la compañera ya lo habló desde Madrid y dijo que el artículo 6 eh, había que oponerse frente a ese artículo. Eh, la Marcha Mundial de las Mujeres también se opone a ese artículo y desde el territorio eh, nosotras también estamos en contra de la eh, venta de los bonos de carbono porque es 
un, un negocio más para el gran capital y los territorios y las comunidades indígenas están defendiendo el bosque nativo que no significa precisamente eliminar las emisiones de gases efecto invernadero porque en Chile lo que se está propagando en forma ilimitada son las plantaciones de pinos y eucaliptos. Sorry, just a sec. Sobre el tema de lo, del bosque nativo, la, la solidaridad y, y, y el acuerdo del artículo. Okay, 6. so in terms of uh, solidarity and climate change, uh, regarding climate change in this crisis that we're living right now, uh, we agree with what our friends from Madrid said. We are against Article 6. Uh, the Women's March is also against Article 6, and us as women here in our territory, we are against Article 6 as well. What, uh, we're not uh, in favor of, selling, of them selling these carbon bonds. And here the indigenous people are protecting the native forest, but not because of the CO2 emissions, but mainly because they are, uh, in those native forests, they are planting uh, eucalyptus and pine trees. Bueno, eh, son muchas la, las necesidades y las problemáticas que nosotros tenemos, pero creemos que eh, todo se tiene que ir eh, avanzando en la medida que el pueblo se vaya uniendo cada vez más. Vamos a seguir en marcha. Por, por lo tanto, mi último mensaje es que estaremos en una marcha por el cambio climático mañana viernes nos juntamos todas las organizaciones sociales eh, en una gran concentración desde la Plaza Dignidad porque ahora sí se llama nuestra plaza la Plaza Dignidad el pueblo le cambió el nombre, el pueblo le quiere dar otra connotación a esa plaza donde se vean allí y se viertan lo, las necesidades y los problemas y donde también la gente se manifieste de forma alegre, contenta, de toda, con, con todas sus expresiones artísticas, culturales. Por lo tanto, estaremos marchando con nuestras consignas y nuestros lienzos. Eh, salvemos la tierra, cambiemos el sistema. We have a lot of needs and we have a lot of problems. And we are moving forward with our demonstrations, uh, with our mobilizations. We want to make a change. And actually, this Friday, tomorrow, we will be marching for climate change. And we will be doing so in our square, which had the name of Italy Square, and now it's called Dignity Square. The people changed the name of the square because of that. And we are going to be demonstrating there with, in different ways, with culture, with art, and with our, our slogan, which is Save Earth. Let's save the Earth and let's change the system. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna have, uh, it's a question for folks. Folks, if you have questions, you can ask them in the chat group if you're on the Zoom app, also on Facebook. Um, I have a question for, um, for both Naisha and Ariel, uh, maybe it's a two-part one, and they and actually two-part that don't kind of relate, but they kind of do. Um, one is oftentimes in these spaces we're out, we're forced to talk about the things we're fighting against, right? Yeah, you know, we're in, when you're at the United Nations climate talks, oftentimes we're just putting all this energy into talking about what we're fighting against, um, and we we are as a as a movement are trying to carve that space out to talk about what we're fighting for. So I think that, I know you both have mentioned it here and there in, in, in the previous answers, but I wanted to get, just kind of give an example, like, or I'll give you another, some more space for both of you, is what are we fighting for? And, and maybe for Ariel, because you're in the thick of it with Article 6 and this whole conversations around carbon markets is like, what is the response to that? And I know that's something that said, you had mentioned is it can't be fixed, but like people ask, well, what do we do? What's the response to that? So I want to maybe have that opportunity um, to give it. And I'm not going to ask the second part. So it's just going to be that part right there. 
you want to go first? Yeah, you could. Oh, God. Um, I, I think when we, well, for first off, I spent the better part of a lot of my, my work in sort of climate justice fighting against something. And I felt I got really burnt out and I felt I got really disheartened, just constantly fighting against something instead of fighting for something. Um, and, and I really think that when you are advocating for something that's going to positively uh, affect your community and generations, and it becomes much more meaningful work. And you also become like, you feel better. And I guess I'm fighting against the state and oppression and white supremacy and colonization and extractivism, but we're fighting for, for our lives and we're fighting for future generations. But in the context of these movements around like, particularly we look at article six, it's like, well, what, what, what are you fighting for? For us, we're fighting for the recognition that our people are our own experts in developing the solutions that we need to not only like safeguard our own communities, but to also build the solutions and what that means. Like we need to fundamentally challenge these systems that have gotten us to where we are. And we can't do it in this homogenous, you know, UN style Paris Accord agreement in doing it. We need decentralized systems that allow us to make autonomous decisions that are based off of localized knowledge systems that have been developed and, and, and nurtured for, for thousands of years. They, we had thriving economies and agricultural systems and trade routes and languages that existed before colonization. And we're stuck being like, how do we fix the problem within the colonial construct that has only existed for a couple hundred years? When our system existed for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years before that. I think we, we're talking about fighting for the recognition that there are actual structures and systems of living and knowing and being on this planet that have been erased from history, demonized and marginalized to the point that people don't believe that they were ever a thing. And we're talking about recognizing and fighting for the recognition of our people's um, knowledge systems of our the value that we have in creating real systemic opportunities to change the course of where we're going, not just for our own communities, but for the life of all people on this planet and all living things on this planet, all the rivers, all the mountains, all the grasslands, all the oceans, all the forests. And that's what we're fighting for. And we're doing it by creating communities that want to see this and believe that this is possible and that these things are fundamentally broken. And that's how we're going to make those shifts. And that's where we need to go, like nurturing those, those powers of our own communities. We are our own experts. We don't need other people telling us how to do it. Yeah, um, just to piggyback off of that, we had things set in place before before um, colonization. We had languages, like you said, we had um, a lot of these things already. And we're, we're fighting for a just transition. We're fighting to go back to how we, we, we lived before. And how we lived before was great. It was, uh, we were thriving, we were doing great for ourselves. And um, so as, to me, the, the, the answer is simple, is why are we even fighting against these things? Because it makes no sense what they're they're um, proposing the simplest thing is to just stop what we're doing and do the right thing and i it's, it's really hard for for people who who drive off of money and who want money and, and and sustained by money to to think about how can i live without money or how can i live a natural life um protecting the earth and um so that's what we're fighting for just transition Thank you well, both for those answers. Um, again, Ariel Duranja with Indigenous Climate Action and Naisha is with, uh, is representing Uprose, right? Naisha Uprose, which is uh, the oldest Latino community-based organization that's doing environmental justice, climate justice work um, in Brooklyn and uh, it's amazing folks. I think I have, I have a question and maybe I, it's whoever wants to answer actually is, you know, uh, uh, both Mafalda and Ariel, you had hit on this before about the move they moved the COP25 from, from Santiago to Madrid and basically moving it from um, a colonial state to the, the colonizer state itself, Spain. Um, how did that affect 
you know, the, the, the social move, movement work that's happening in Chile, um, and what, you know, the, does that, did that ease some tension or pressure on the actual countries themselves in this whole negotiating process, right? Because they're like, you, you're having your, the idea was to have a climate change conference where they're talking about neoliberal practices when outside there's this massive movement against neoliberalism. So uh, maybe some thoughts on, on more, just a little bit more perspective on that um, is one of the questions that came from the, the chat group. So I wanted to ask whoever wants to respond to that. Um, go right ahead. I, I, I can speak on, I mean, I just want to say one thing real quick about that. We definitely need to stop neo, neoliberalism at home, right? And we definitely need to get Trump out of office. We need to get him out of office, right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> and anyone else, any other officials who has the same same views as he does, because, you know, we got to stop. We got to get them out. Um, we have to change our mindsets, like Ariel said, you know, we have to get back to being harmonious with our land, with ourselves and with our land. So um, that's just my piece. But I'll go ahead and get, get, it, get it over to, uh, to my father here. <laughs> bueno, eh, yo voy a responder primero también a, a la primera pregunta breve. Eh, la agricultura campesina sí cambia el, el, la crisis climática. De partida somos una convencida de que la agricultura campesina puede enfriar el planeta. Y en contra de toda la agricultura agroindustrial que sí la está calentando. Por lo tanto, esa es una solución verdadera. Y lo otro sobre cómo se da esta situación de que de un país colonizadora eh, a otro colonizado llegaba a la COP. Eh, <laughs> disculpe por la traducción. Ok, okay so uh, to answer the first question, I believe the answer is in farmers doing agriculture. I believe that's the answer and that is actually something that, go, that will stop global warming and what's not stopping global warming it's the amount of industries that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Eh, sobre ese tema, en, en Chile se estaba hablando mucho de la segunda colonización. Primero, la primera fue hace más de 500 años y dejó secuelas terribles entre las familias campesinas e indígenas, principalmente el pueblo mapuche, que fue el que le opuso 300 años de resistencia. Y... Eh, ahora entonces se hablaba de la segunda colonización cuando vienen todos los capitalistas desde España a privatizar, a seguir y profundizar la privatización del agua, la privatización de la electricidad, todos los sistemas alternativos energéticos, por lo tanto las carreteras, las carreteras están hechas por empresas españolas, Así que eh, se hablaba ya de una segunda colonización y cuando se producen estos asaltos y estas rebeldías eh, ilimitadas en los bancos son eh, precisamente por esa, esa rebeldía acumulada en contra de todo este coloniaje que hablamos en nuestro continente que viene desde Europa. And regarding COP25 we say that we have a second colonization. The first one took place 500 years ago and had consequences on our indigenous people. These are the Mapuches who fought for 300 years of those 500. They fought for 300 years and, and that's, well, just a sec. And the second colonization uh, has to do with the Spanish again and Spanish businessmen who are the ones that own the water that own highways and we have to pay for all of those uh, services and resources and the fact that we are seeing this rebellion in Chile in banks and other institutions as well is because of how angry we are with this second colonization. I have a, a question for um, from the chat group and this is for both of our, for all of our folks. It's a, it's, it's a question that comes up a lot is, you know, um, we often, folks get often called hypocrites, right? For traveling places to advocate for the protection of the land. 
Um, I know we get it all the time. I would love to hear your all responses. How do you respond to that? You know, um, saying like, you, you get the, the question, right? Is you're traveling to different places, you use fossil fuels to get there. Um, I, I'm, I'm, my own response is to quickly nudge is like, that's one of the reasons why we're having this webinar. So folks don't have to travel, they can actually be at home and actually get feedback and hear what's happening um, through through the, our digital tools here. But I wanna ask folks uh, what you all think, maybe go over to, since we just heard from folks in uh, Chile, uh, maybe ask folks in Spain what you might think in response to that when you get called a hypocrite when you're trying to fight fossil fuel development? Um, I think it's, it's funny <laughs> when people say things like that because they only ask that to people of color and indigenous people. They don't ask that to, to the white people who are here and, and, and you know doing what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. They only ask that to us. And how do you want us to fight and how do you want us to, to speak up and um, and have our part in this role if we can't be there. The only way we can have change is if we're there in person because we have to hold these people accountable and we can't be there in person if we have no way to get there. And that's why a lot of young people of color are stuck at home because they, they can't get to these places. They don't know how to and they don't feel like they have a voice mm -hmm. and they don't feel like they have a voice. And if you're telling them, oh, well, you're, you're fighting for this, but you're not, following that. Well, we can't do that right now because we're not in the space where we can do that. So we're trying to get to that space. And until we get to that space, we have to do what we have. We have to make ends meet and make it to the spaces where our voices need to be heard. I, I just want to add one thing to this because one of the, the new add-on to this is that um, are you like, you, are you going to fly there? Are you going to walk the walk and, <laughs> and, and, and you talk the talk or whatever? Um, like Greta's doing it. Mm -hmm. As if, as if we all have access to billionaires who are going to uh, sail us across the ocean and, and you know, Tesla sponsoring us in EV vehicles all the time. Like we don't, we don't even, like people don't see us in the streets. They don't want our voices to be heard. We don't have white privilege. We don't have the ability to enter into these spaces in the way that other people can. So we have to make sacrifices. We have to do these things. We don't have that same privilege as everyone else. And of course, it's always going to be the people of color and indigenous folks that are getting criticized for this shit because they want to make us the bad guy all the time because no one wants to look at their own complicity in the, in the crisis that we're in. And absolutely, we're, we participate in these systems, but we have been given no other option. We were not a part of the creation of these systems. And now we're criticized because we've been forced to participate in these structures and when we try to break them we're told to get over it and that we're just gonna like just join the rest of us and then when we join the rest of them we're told we're hypocrites so i, I can't even i can't even with that question <laughs> all right not i think beautiful answers we're coming close end of the time here of this webinar oh okay go ahead go ahead yes e e Y yo puedo agregar que para nosotros esto, estos eventos donde nos encontramos todos los movimientos sociales, las organizaciones, los activistas, los militantes, es un evento que nos ayuda a fortalecernos porque aprovechamos todos estos espacios para nuestra propia formación. Por lo tanto, la, la formación se da en estos espacios y la retroalimentación desde las distintas organizaciones es muy fundamental para fortalecernos como, movi como movimientos a nivel de, eh, planetario. Así que con eso, ¡alerta! 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 Alerta que camina la lucha campesina por América Latina. Okay, so uh, I would like to add that for us to be part of these type of events and of these social movements and activists, uh, it helps us and it helps us to educate ourselves. This is the way we educate ourselves and we understand many other concepts and things like uh, getting feedback from other organizations and other activists that help us strengthen our movement. And the chant? No? Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's it. The chant was, uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Chant. Good, yes. <laughs> do the, how about do the chant again and then translate it. 
we were just saying uh, alerta. It was just actually a chat that they have out here from, which is, from, which is uh, que, la, la, la chanta que nosotros estamos diciendo. Alerta, alerta. Yeah. Alerta que camina la lucha campesina por América Latina sí, de, la, de la vía campesina. Okay. El movimiento internacional la vía campesina. It's an international chant uh, from the uh, farmers. Farmers. La vía campesina. Uh, Thank you for that. Actually, that answered the question someone had asked about some chants that are that folks are using. So thank you for ask, asking that. All right, um, that's the time that we have for this webinar. That's the end of this the of this moment. And I thank you each and every one of you to the panelists who joined us, to the folks who are watching at home. This is being recorded, so folks can watch it much later after the fact. Um, and can inform themselves about what's happening. But to stay in contact, um, to kind of keep up with what's going on, you can follow along. It Takes Roots on Facebook, Instagram, I think also on Twitter. You can follow uh, Indigenous uh, Climate Action. You can follow um, Indigenous Environmental Network on Facebook. On Instagram, it's Indigenous Rising. And um, there's also Grassroots Global Justice Alliance and Climate, Climate Justice Alliance as well. We're, this is it takes roots in its purest form. The, this, this alliance of alliances, where we understood, where we understand the necessity for us to organize, to network, and to mobilize for a better future for all of us. And that, that I don't have liberation until my my relatives across the world have liberation as well. And that we have to support each other in our struggles against neoliberalism, white supremacy, and capitalism and all the other forms of oppression that affect communities of color, black folks, brown folks, indigenous folks all across this land. We do it for our future generations, for our children, for our great, great grandchildren, and also for all other life on this planet. As we say in my community as, and where I come from, a lot of indigenous peoples uh, from Turtle Island, we do it for the next seven generations and beyond. So thank you all for joining this webinar. Thank you for our panelists. Um, uh, Ariel, Naisha, Mafalda, Christian, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Um, safe travels and journey. I know it's nighttime over in Spain, um, and so everyone get rest well. Make sure you make sure your voices are strong, and we'll see you later. So thank you everyone for joining us. Goodbye. That's my, bye 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 gracias. Bye. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, my father, I'm good. <laughs> 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 <laughs>